Good morning and welcome to our worship together uh, this morning, Sunday the 28th of June from First Hollywood Presbyterian Church. Our, our service this morning is led uh, for us by our uh, vacancy convener, Reverend Nigel Craig, preaching from Genesis chapter 41, uh, the subject of Pharaoh's dreams. Our children's birthdays and talk are led this morning by Ruth Bromley, uh, and later in the service, there is an update uh, put together by Charlie from some of our young people, uh, updating us on what they have been doing together with uh, Connect, uh, Pit Stop, and Young Life over these past months, followed by our uh, prayers of intercession together, uh, led for us by uh, Christina Bailey. A number of you have asked me to uh, pass on your thanks to Ben Harbinson for the work that he does in putting together uh, these online services. I have passed those on to him, but I also want to take this opportunity publicly uh, to thank him once again uh, for all the work uh, and skill that he puts into those each week. Also to let you know that um, our online services for July are shared with our friends in High Street. We had originally planned uh, to physically meet together with them for the month of July, uh, two weeks hosted by each church. Uh, obviously, our physically, physical location will not be any different uh, each week as we will still be in our living rooms. But as an expression of our unity in Christ and support for each other, uh, we meet together virtually. Um, the first two weeks hosted by High Street and the second two weeks hosted uh, by First Hollywood. Also to remind you that the church at First Hollywood remains open for individual private prayer on Mondays between half past 10 and half past 11, and on Thursdays between half past two and half past three, uh, ending on Thursday the 9th of July. During those times, there is also a box on a table outside the church office, uh, which if you wish to leave any items for the church office, you may do so. Also to put in your diaries, the next storehouse collection of groceries will be from First Hollywood Church Car Park on Wednesday the 29th of July between 12 noon and 2 p.m. And again, the post box at the front of the church will be emptied immediately after that time if there are any items that you wish to leave for the church office. Now let us continue in our service of worship together. Good morning and welcome to this service of worship uh, from Belmont Presbyterian Church uh, Mance Grounds. As you can see, Belmont Presbyterian Church is just behind me. Give you a welcome uh, if you're joining me from Belmont Congregation or from First Hollywood where I'm the convener or indeed if you're watching anywhere else uh, across the world and I know we've got people uh, checking in from uh, places as far as the States uh, and I think even Abu Dhabi or somewhere like that, uh, you're very welcome as you're following uh, the service today. Um, my name is Nigel Craig. I say I'm the minister here in the church and also convening the vacancy of First Hollywood. Uh, as I'm conducting worship today, I hope uh, I'm not going to be disturbed too much by our cat Ragamuffin, um, who seems to have joined me in the garden here. So if you hear a few noises, uh, you'll understand that it's the cat. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us worship God. I'd like to begin by reading from Psalm 147. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. And words that Jesus himself spoke. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. 
We pray together, and I'd like to use words from the godly Bernard of Clairvaux from the 12th century. Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, thou fount of life, thou light of men, from the best bliss that earth imparts, we turn unfilled to thee again. Thy truth unchanged hath ever stood, thou savest those that on thee call. To them that seek thee, thou art good, to them that find thee, all in all. We taste thee, O thou living bread, and long to feast upon thee still. We drink of thee the fountain head, and thirst our souls from thee to fill. Our restless spirits yearn for thee, where'er our changeful lot is cast. Glad when thy gracious smile we see, blessed when our faith can hold thee fast. O Jesus, ever with us stay, make all our moments calm and bright, chase the dark night of sin away, shed o'er the world thy holy light. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and we use the words that he has taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Hello everybody, so I'm on the birthday bucket this week and is it your birthday Bess? No. No, no, it's not Bess's birthday. But we thought because the person whose birthday it is lives really close to us that we would come and visit them and do the birthday bucket in person at a little bit of a distance, okay? So we're nearly there. I'm gonna pause the video and next time hopefully you're gonna see the person whose birthday it is. Okay, so here's the birthday boy. Do you want to tell us what your name is? Ronan. Ronan. And Ronan, can you tell us when your birthday is and what age you're going to be? 24th of June, Wednesday, and they're going to be nine. Okay, so this is being recorded on Monday, so that's your birthday's on Wednesday, which is last Wednesday, whenever we all see this. Brilliant. And what do you think you hope, what do you hope you're going to get as your present? I'm going to hope I get a metal detector. Okay, brilliant. Now, Ronan, I'm going to pray for you, so just hang on a wee second. Yep. You ready? Okay, God, thank you for Ronan. Thank you that he is going to be nine on Wednesday. Thank you for all that he is and all that he brings to our church family. And we pray for his mummy and daddy and for Phoebe as well. And just pray you'll bless them as they celebrate his birthday in this slightly weird time that we're all having. But just thank you for him. Hi everybody, um, so this morning I went to see Ronan um, and Phoebe and Joanne uh, so that I could do the birthday bucket with Ronan. I should tell you that we're recording this on Monday, so Ronan's birthday is on Wednesday but by the time you'll have seen this, his birthday will be passed. Um, one of the things that Ronan said that he was hoping to get for his birthday and that I know he did get um, is a metal detector. And it kind of struck me that metal detectors are brilliant things that you could walk along the beach or in the countryside with your metal detector on and you never know what you might find anything from a rusty old nail to some treasure um, and the metal detector would go beep 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 whenever it finds something at least i think that's what it would do um, and it got me thinking about a story in the bible where it, the man in the story, it probably been really helpful if he had had a metal detector. Um, and it's a story that Jesus told when he lived on earth. And I'm just going to read it for you really quickly. And it's really short in the Bible. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, I imagine if he lived today, he might have used a metal detector. He hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. For that man, that treasure meant everything. He gave away everything, sold everything he had so that he could buy the field to have that treasure because it was worth more than anything else he had. And this story is a parable that Jesus told. So it's not a, it's not a story of something that actually happened, but it's a story Jesus used to illustrate something about who God was and he basically he was saying that whenever we we meet God whenever we get to know him whenever he becomes our friend he is the most important thing and that we nothing else is important compared to him and that everything else takes second place that he is the one that takes the most important part of our lives that he is the treasure that we're looking for and in the Jesus story book Bible it says this just after Jesus tells that story it says coming home to God is as wonderful as finding a treasure you might have to dig before you find it you might have to look before you see it you might even have to give up everything you have to get it but being where God is being in his kingdom that's more important than anything else in the world and it's worth anything you have to give up because God is the real treasure and I don't know about you but I knew in the last few weeks 
we've all had to give up a lot. Um, we've had to give up our freedom to be able to just go wherever we want at any time. We've had to give up maybe seeing people. You've had to give up being at school. Maybe some of you think that's not such a bad thing. Um, we've had to give up being together in church. I've had to give up being in my job for 13 weeks, as many other people have. And some things we've just had to give up and we're slowly getting those things back. But actually, the one thing we haven't had to give up is being part of God's kingdom and being part of his family. And isn't it incredible to know that even when we're all separate and we're in our houses and life is very different, that our treasure, being part of God's kingdom, is something that we haven't and never will have to give up. So this week, as uh, as you're doing all the things you're doing, um, as Ronan is maybe out with his metal detector this week, let's think about the, the treasure that we have already found through being part of God's family. Now we're going to sing the kids song together um, and we'll just remember who God is um, and the place that he has in our lives. Have a good week. See you all soon. Bye. Our scripture reading is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Genesis, chapter 41. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep, and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of corn, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offences today, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. We dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. 
When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favourable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty through all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land, and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those years that are coming, and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities, and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. Amen. And we pray that God will bless this reading from his word. We pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray with the help of your Holy Spirit we might be able to make a connection between the story that has taken place in the ancient world with our contemporary world today. Please guide me as I speak and help us all as we listen. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. I wonder if somebody had asked you this time last year, what are your plans for 2020? I wonder how you might have answered. You may have seen the meme or cartoon type picture. If 2020 were a slide in a playground, and under this there was a picture of a large cheese grater in the, sla- in the shape of a slide. Ouch. Or you may have seen another meme entitled Plans for 2020. In one picture, someone is swimming, obliviously, in the deep waters. In the others, we see the unmistakable gaping mouth of Jaws, the great white shark. And of course, she's swimming towards the shark. All joking aside, I think we all know by now that 2020 has not turned out as most of us had planned. And sadly for many, 2020 has been a very difficult year so far. But come to think of it, has any year turned out as you had planned? Probably not. 
Today we're going to turn to the next instalment in our study of the life of the patriarch Joseph to see how his life was turning out very differently from how he may have planned it. In fact, it's not just Joseph's life that followed an unexpected route. It's also the story of ancient Egypt, the story of God's covenant people Israel, and it's our story too. Solomon wisely observed, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Proverbs 19.21 So what's the take-home message of today? Well, I hope we can see that we are not in charge of our lives, but God is. Consequently, we need to humbly submit to his ways. We need to trust in his salvation and in his providential care. So let's turn to our passage. The opening words of this chapter can't be severed from the final words of chapter 40. You probably remember that Joseph was cruelly sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites and Midianites. He ended up a slave in Egypt. There he was purchased by a high-ranking official called Potiphar. After some time, Potiphar's wife falsely accused Joseph of sexual assault. Consequently, Joseph ended up in prison. Whilst in this second pit, as it were, Joseph assisted two of his fellow prisoners by interpreting their dreams. You may remember how Joseph asked one of them, the chief cupbearer, if he could remember him to Pharaoh, thus securing his release. Alas, we read in chapter 40 and verse 23 that he did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now, the very following verse and if you remember in, in the ancient texts, there were no chapter divisions. We note that Joseph languished in prison for a further two years. Now, Joseph may have been in his 20s or 30s at this time. It could be argued that he was wasting the best years of his life in prison. Undoubtedly, this is not how he planned his life. Makes you think, doesn't it? Some of us, I'm sure, feel like we're, we're trapped in a bit of a prison at the moment. Maybe you feel imprisoned in your own home. Or maybe, for some of you, you just think that life circumstances are a prison. Maybe you feel like you're wasting your life. And possibly even like Joseph, you might feel forgotten. And who knows what's gone through your mind. Some of you maybe think that the best solution is walking. And I don't mean walking for exercise. Maybe walking out of a marriage. Walking away from a job. Or even walking away from life itself. These temptations can actually be quite strong for those who are approaching the middle of their lives. Now I don't know the complications or the pain that you're facing at this time. But I would love you to give some consideration to these words of Jesus to Peter. John 13 and 7, in a different context admittedly, but I think they can apply to our lives. Jesus says, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. What I'm doing in your life right now you mightn't understand. But afterwards, you will understand. Joseph would eventually understand why he had been brought down to Egypt as a slave in his latter years. Yet Joseph would never really understand in his own lifetime the contribution that he made to the preserving of the faithful seed that would finally bloom in the person of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Although he had been, been forgotten by men, God had not forgotten about him and God was working out his purposes in his life. So that's Joseph. But if we turn back to verse 1, we read that Pharaoh had two consecutive dreams, both of which were set on the banks of the great river Nile. The first dream was of seven well-fed cows cooling down in the river, coming out of the river, being consumed by seven skinny cows also coming out of the river. See that in verses 2 to 4 and 17 to 21. In spite of this bovine cannibalistic feast, 
the latter group of cows remains as ugly as before. They haven't put on any weight. The second dream was also very strange. It was of seven full and plump ears of corn, which were swallowed up by seven thin ears, blighted and withered by the east wind. Verses 5 to 7 and 22 to 24. Now, according to verse 8 of this passage, Pharaoh's spirit was troubled, and he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt to interpret these dreams. So, you probably realise it's not just ordinary people like us who are troubled in our minds, who suffer illness, who are distressed or are in pain. Money or position can't shield anybody from such things, even the monarch. Last week we noted that in the ancient Near East, uh, importance was placed on dreams, so much so that dream books were put together in Egypt and Babylon. Babylonia to assist in their interpretation. Now, even though these tools may not have been available, no one was found competent in the court of Pharaoh at that time to help him in his distress. Now, it's at this point that the cupbearer remembers Joseph and how he had rightly interpreted his dream and that of the baker. So he begins grovelingly uh, acknowledging his earlier offence to Pharaoh, which landed him in prison a few years previously, although he should have acknowledged his offence against Joseph. But he said, you know, I know somebody who can interpret dreams. Without delay, the vexed monarch commands that Joseph be quickly released from prison and brought into his presence. After the necessary physical preparations, Joseph appears before Pharaoh, who says, I have heard that you can interpret dreams. To which Joseph responds, it's not in me. But God will give Pharaoh a favourable answer, or God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So Joseph's acknowledging, listen, I can't interpret the dream on my own, nor can I bring Pharaoh peace of mind. Only God can do that. I'm simply his servant. If you take a look through this chapter, you'll see that Joseph refers to God's power to interpret and carry out the events foretold in those dreams four times. Let's not forget that Joseph has appeared before Pharaoh. He's one of the mightiest men in the ancient world. He's one whose whole worldview was shaped by the polytheism of Egypt. He has this pantheon of gods and goddesses in his mind and no doubt decorating his palace. And yet, Joseph stands there before the mightiest man in the ancient world and testifies to the greatness of his God, who was the living and the true God. Now I hope that this will be a spur to all of us to be a bit more confident in speaking of our Lord wherever he places us, even if we find ourselves in hostile surroundings. The Pharaoh then continues to relate the content of his dreams to Joseph. Joseph listens intently and with the help of God, and we see in verse 38 it's actually with the help of the Spirit of God, Joseph announces that God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now I'm not going to rehearse the dreams or the interpretation in detail for we all should know from reading the passage the seven uh, good cows and the seven full ears of corn represent seven years of abundance whereas the seven emaciated cows and the seven haggard ears of corn represented seven years of famine, in which the good ears would be swallowed up and quickly forgotten by the bad. Joseph then announced to Pharaoh something that may have shocked the pagan king. This has all been fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Verse 31. I wonder why this might have sounded a little bit odd to Pharaoh. You're probably aware the Nile naturally overflowed its banks every year. Certainly that was the case before the construction of the Aswam High Dam. Ancient Egyptians eagerly awaited this inundation in the months of July, August and September, bringing life to the parched land. Now, the ancient Egyptians had various myths to account for this life-giving annual phenomenon. One such myth related to the god Happy. Now, it's not the word happy, H-A-P-P-Y, but H-A-P-Y. 
the Egyptologist G. J. Shaw writes, Although the Nile itself was not personified as a god, the inundation was referred to as the arrival of the god Happy, and it was through his action that fertility was brought back to the land. It was understood that all food existed because of Happy's work. All herds were fattened because Happy allowed crops to grow. On the other hand, if Happy made only a dismal appearance, chaos descended. Everyone was poor, people died, and fighting broke out. Now rather than the god Happy being responsible for the annual overflow of the Nile, rather than Happy being responsible for fertility, crops and cattle, the living and the true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, he was the one who had the power to flood the earth, just as he did under Noah. And he had the power to hold back even the flooding of the mighty Nile. Now the Egyptians, including Pharaoh himself, may have planned for a stable future, trusting in their gods. The living and the true God, however, had other plans. The ancient Egyptians needed to learn that God controlled everything, including the natural world. I think we need to relearn that lesson too in post-Christian West. Calvin wrote many centuries ago, It is right to be fully persuaded that whenever the earth is barren, whether frost or drought or hail or any other thing may be the cause of it, the whole is directed by the counsel of God. And you know, we could add, whenever there's a global pandemic, the whole is directed by the counsel of God. Let me return to the original question. Imagine somebody had asked you this time last year, what are your plans for 2020? How might you have answered? Most people, and that probably includes us as Christian believers too, imagine that we can make fairly definite plans about the future. We're loath now as Christians to use the two letters DV, Deo Valente, God willing. We're kind of smarter than that. We think we've outgrown that. And so we make financial plans. We rely on the markets, on a stable economy, on big businesses, and on our own industry. We make family plans, whom we want to marry, how many children we want to have, where we want to live, and so on. We make educational and career plans. We plan for recreation and holidays. I'm thinking about the holiday that we've planned this year, and at this stage I don't know whether it's going to take place. We make plans for our churches. And most of us expect to have long and healthy lives. Now, in one sense, this is to be expected. The scriptures encourage us to exercise wisdom and to make provision for our families, churches and communities and indeed for the future. However, as we can see from these chapters, we can plan all that we like. But in the end, it's the purposes of the Lord that are the only things that will stand. There's an old word, seldom used now, to describe God's ultimate control of everything. And the opposite of that means that we're not actually in control of anything. It's the word providence. You may remember the Shorter Catechism in the 11th question, what are God's works of providence? And the answer is God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. The Puritans used to say God's providence is the last refuge of the saints. Writing a century later, the godly Scottish minister George Lawson would write, We can never make the proper use of what befalls us or of what we see around us unless we remember that all things are under the direction of divine providence. I wonder what difference it would make to our lives if when our plans are interrupted or even thrown on their heads, if we could actually say with real humility and deep faith, 
This is all according to the counsel of God's will, according to his providential care. And to be able to confess, I believe that God is holy. I believe that God is wise and powerful. And I believe that he lovingly preserves my life and controls all things. Don't forget in your Bibles to underline Romans 8 and 28 and Ephesians 1 and 11. Now before we leave this chapter, we are left with a nagging question. Why? Why are seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine on God's plan? Why did God allow Joseph to experience so much injustice, followed by years of promotion and blessing? Well, I think the answer can be found in the little word grace. It's not a word that appears here, but we find it throughout the scriptures. Grace, as you know, is God's favour towards sinful people. This chapter, I believe, gives us an example of both common grace and saving grace. Common grace. Calvin makes a significant point whenever he was preaching in this narrative. He says, immediately after the wound has been shown, the means of cure were suggested. Immediately after the wound had been shown, the means of cure were suggested. So why did God reveal this 14-year plan to Pharaoh, a pagan king? Well, in verses 33 to 36, Joseph advises the king to set in action a nationwide effort to preserve food for the years ahead, overseen by a discerning and wise man. Next week, we'll find out that Joseph will be promoted to that position. And just as God gives the beasts their food and the young ravens when they cry, Psalm 147 and 9, so the eyes of all look to him to give them their food in due season. Psalm 104, 27. Do you remember when Jesus said that God our Father causes his son to rise in the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust? Matthew 5, 45. Well, this chapter clearly testifies to God's common grace, even to idolatrous Egyptians. He warns them of coming disaster and yet he also gives them time to prepare. By listening to the word of the Lord, the Egyptians would be preserved, and through them, God's own covenant people. God in his common grace still cares for every person. In his common grace, he enables us as a human race to respond to natural disasters and pandemics through good government, science, medical care, key workers, charitable involvement, community good, and so on. And so today we thank God for his common grace and we pray for more of it. Of course, the story of Joseph is set within the Hebrew Bible with its concentration on God's relationship with his covenant people. The story of how God elects, calls, redeems and keeps his people is actually the story of saving grace. Just as Joseph suffered humiliation, and was then raised to a position of honour to ensure that God's people received bread and famine, so too God has allowed his only begotten Son to suffer humiliation and death in the flesh, followed by the honour of resurrection and ascension. Why? So that we might feed on the bread of life. Wonderfully, this bread of life, Jesus Christ himself, is offered not just to the descendants of Israel, but to all people, of whatever nation or ethnicity, offered to all who will turn to Jesus Christ by faith. Are you feeling hungry at the minute? I'm not talking about whether you're going to have a cup of coffee and a piece of toast or scone after this service. But I'm talking about spiritually. Are you hungry? Jesus Christ has made provision for us all. He is the bread of life. I wonder, are you despairing that your plans have been altered beyond recognition? Well, I pray that the Holy Spirit would help all of us to bow our heads before the great and loving God, to hear his voice and respond in faith. And I close with words from Isaiah 45 that give us a sense of the majesty of our God 
and yet also of his loving care. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? I am the Lord, and there is no other. I am a righteous God and a saviour. There is none besides me. So turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. Amen. time the young people met together in church was the 15th of March. We knew there were changes ahead but we had no idea what they would be or even that we wouldn't be able to meet the following Sunday. As it became clear that we wouldn't be able to see each other in person for a long time, we realised we needed to find a new way to connect. With all the uniformed organisations coming to an end for the year, how on earth would the other groups continue? Connect, like many groups and individuals, decided to make use of Zoom for online meetings each Sunday morning. These have alternated between meeting before and after the online church service is shown. The 14 young people in Connect, most of them have been there most weeks and there's been real commitment to meeting together. We've spent time catching up on each other's needs, which has got more very recently. We also have had quizzes, sermon discussions, shared Bible verses that have spoken to us and looked at the lives of inspiring Christians, including Richard Scott, C.T. Studd and C.S. Lewis. Somebody very kindly gifted us each two C.S. Lewis books so that we can use some of our spare time reading a Narnia story and a screw tip letter, so thank you very much. Thanks also to the congregation who sent us a study Bible at the start of lockdown to help us regularly spend time reading God's Word. It's important to connect together, 
for connecting with Jesus is our first goal. Every day we receive a text message called the Daily Connect. It has a Bible verse, uh, it has a question and a prayer and helps us to focus on Jesus that day. Pit Stop has also moved online and we meet over Zoom each week. It has been a little bit different, but the fact that we have the opportunity to meet together once a week has been really worth it. We have been going through Young Alpha material, which is one of the ways we have been able to recalibrate ourselves to God during lockdown. Each week we watch the video from the Alpha team and in our normal girls and guys small groups we process it and discuss what challenged us or any questions that we may have about what was said. Young Life and Wild Life have also continued to meet each week but have joined together in an online weekly meeting. The response to this has been good with most people that have attended club this year joining in. Each week's club was based on a theme, for example countries, where we had to dress up as a country to try and win a prize. We usually played games, chatted for a while, or did quizzes based on the themes with everyone involved. Then there was a short talk from the leaders each week. Now that restrictions are being eased, Young Life leaders have started meeting in person with young people again, while making sure to keep in line with government guidelines. This is a real boost and hopefully will continue throughout the summer. It has been amazing that, even though we haven't been able to meet up like we normally do, young people have still been given the opportunity to enjoy being together regularly, to learn God's word and to be encouraged. Some young adults have also been meeting for a weekly online Bible study. Whatever is possible as we move forward, God has been so good to us in these last few weeks to enable us to do all of these activities. Please continue to pray for us young people in the congregation over the summer, which will still be quite different. We don't know what lies ahead, but we do know that God is faithful and together we seek his help and strength. And now our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, we humbly come before you, remembering how glorious and gracious you are. We praise you for your faithfulness to us during this time. As we continue to miss being together as a church family, we ask for your presence with us all as we worship you and bring you our prayers for others today. We pray for the children and young people in our church family. As we've just heard about some of the activities during lockdown, we pray your protection on all the children and young people as they consider their faith in response to all that is happening. We pray that they would experience you, God, knowing that they are loved by you and our church family. As we move into summer, we pray for joy and fun in their lives, even as the restrictions continue. Father God, we pray for the church. We thank you for the gift of church family that we get to share together and learn what it is to follow you together. We pray for your blessing over our joint services with High Street Presbyterian Church 3 July. We thank you for them as a church family and we pray you would bless our fellowship even while we may not gather together. We pray for Reverend Jimmy Warburton and the session there. Lord, bless the ministry of all the churches in Hollywood. We pray more people would come to know you in our community. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with all ministers, especially in our Presbyterian church in Ireland. There's been so much change over the past months and they have continued to teach and pastor us. We praise you for the innovation we have seen and the faithfulness to serve your people, Lord. We pray for Reverend Nigel Craig, our vacancy convener, that he would be renewed through rest in the summer months and that you would draw close mm -hmm. to him. We also thank you for, for Craig Russell, our clerk of session. We pray that you would bless and protect Craig as he continues to lead, serve 
and connect our church family. Finally, God, we come before you thinking of those in need today. We pray for those who are unwell in our church family and we ask for your healing touch. We pray for those who feel they have no value and we ask for your love for them to be felt. And we pray for the oppressed and we ask that you would rescue them. Lord, we ask for your grace and peace as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.